Our text this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved." He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the darkness, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the light of the world, sent by your love, sent for our sins, sent to redeem us. We thank you for him and ask that as we come to your word, would you fix our eyes on Christ that we might walk in the light and walk in your love. We pray these things in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and amen. Amen. We're continuing on with this series on the Gospel of John, and so now we hit chapter 3, where we hit uh, John 3.16, our our most well-known text of Scripture. Uh, It begins here with just the story of Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, and we're told at the beginning here that Nicodemus came to Jesus uh, by night. Um, It doesn't say it in the text here, but we assume that this was probably for fear of being seen by the other Jews hanging out with Jesus, which was apparently a dangerous thing to do. In, uh, In chapter 12, verse 42, we're told this, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So listening to Jesus was, for many of the rulers at the time, kind of a guilty pleasure. They liked to hear him, but they were scared of being associated with him. And so they would hide their coming and, and, uh, and, and conversing with Jesus. Um, many centuries later, during the Reformation, there were a lot of French Protestants who were convinced of the Protestant position, uh, but they kept their secret, their convictions a secret because they lived in a Catholic nation with a Catholic king and a very strong Catholic system. And if anybody found out that they believed in the Protestant uh, teaching, that they knew that they would be persecuted and possibly executed. And so um, Calvin invented the term Nicodemites to describe these people who would hold to this conviction secretly, but never let anybody else know about it. He called them Nicodemites after Nicodemus here, who sees Jesus at night. Now, Nicodemus says that uh, he knows that Jesus is from God. Look at verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he knows, he knows that Jesus is, is, um, is from God in some sense, um, and, I, and he knows this because he's been convinced by the signs that Jesus has performed. Now, I told you a little while ago that this is the book of signs, and the first uh, half of the Gospel of John is taken up by these seven signs that Jesus will perform. But he's actually only performed one sign so far in the Gospel of John, um, the, the water to wine. 
But, but we're told, if you look at um, the end of the Gospel of John, John 21, 25, the very last verse, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. So John is telling us that Jesus performed a multitude of signs, and he's only recorded a handful of them. So he's picked these seven signs to structure his book. But up until this point, Jesus has already performed a multitude of signs that Nicodemus has seen and has realized this man has come from God. This man is a, a teacher from God. But, but when Nicodemus says this, I think that he's assuming that from God means a godly teacher. This guy is... Uh, a really godly teacher. This man has been sent uh, by God the way maybe Elijah or Moses um, had been sent by God. He's assuming that he's a prophet that has been specially called and set aside by God and sent out uh, to perform these signs. But Jesus is about to let him know that his from God is a much more uh, at a, a much more profound level. He is from God. But when Jesus says he is from God, it means something far more than when we said Moses or Abraham or Elijah were from God. And, and we see this in verse 3. Jesus is, he's really about to mess with Nicodemus. And look at the next couple of verses. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus is saying there that there is a, there is a kingdom of God. There is a nation. Look at, at verse 5. Um, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, as well as back in verse 3. He cannot see the kingdom of God unless he's been born again like this. So Jesus is saying that there's this kingdom there's this nation that Nicodemus doesn't know about. And that's really surprising because remember, Nicodemus was introduced to us as one of the rulers of the Jews. So he's a, in a very exclusive sect that is over all of the Jewish people that are still in Israel. And they're the, the Jewish nation occupied by Rome. And they're thinking about the identity of their nation and how they're going to someday God will bless them. They'll rise up and they'll drive out the Romans and Israel will rule the world again. And Nicodemus is at the very top of this food chain, one of the rulers of this nation of Israel. And here Jesus, a teacher from God, comes and says, there's another kingdom, there's another nation, there's another country that you don't even know about. You can't even see and you can't even enter into it until you've gone through this mystical transformation of being born again. And it, it rattles Nicodemus. He's wondering, what is this nation that you're talking about? What is this kingdom? And how can I possibly be born again to enter into this world? And it, it, I think that it's worth us thinking about for a moment because actually Jesus is describing what is true of our world right now. We're standing here watching our nation being shaken by all kinds of crazy uh, pressures and tumults and whatnot. And we need to remember that what Jesus announced here in John is still growing in our very midst. That there is another country, there is another nation, there is another citizenship that we belong to. And this nation is not being shaken whatsoever by the tumult that we're going through. And this nation is the eternal nation, the one that will live forever. And our citizenship in that nation is far more significant and far more important. So what Jesus is calling Nicodemus to is something we need to remember that he's calling us to. We are citizens of heaven. And Jesus is announcing this nation to Nicodemus, a ruler of Israel, who didn't know about it. Um, and he says that in order to enter this kingdom you have to be reborn. You have to be reborn. And, and this idea is just ridiculous to Nicodemus. Verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, to understand this little bit right here, we have to go on a, a bit of a, a rabbit trail um, just, uh, just to kind of look at this period and, and what they believed at this time. In the, in the intertestamental period, meaning between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament when, um, when Jesus is appearing here, you had had um, rabbinic theology developed quite a lot. And th there was a rabbinic interpretation of the Old Testament that, became to the, that came to sort of dominate everybody's understanding of how uh, they were supposed to read their Bible and what obedience looked like. 
And, and during this time, one of the things that becomes really strong is this really strong belief that Israel is a set-aside, set aside, set-apart people. They're a holy people that have been set apart. They're pure. They're clean. And the Gentiles are this um, uh, impure and unclean world. Okay, They're the, the goyim. That's the, the Hebrew word for Gentiles. They're the goyim. And then there are the Jews. And there's a strong distinction between them. They're unclean and impure. And the Jews are clean and pure. And that distinction grew um, stronger uh, during this period. And so you have, for instance, the, um, the belief that it was uh, not okay for a Jew to sit down and eat with a Gentile. Remember that Peter uh, later on in Acts is offended at the idea of sitting and eating with Gentiles. Well, actually, if you dig through the Old Testament, you find that's not a law, right? You, you can't find that prohibition. That was, that was a kind of a, a tradition that had developed that because the Gentiles are so unclean and impure, you can't hang out with them. But that wasn't in the Old Testament. It was during the inter- intertestamental period that people came up with this idea. And one of the arguments that they had was that the Gentiles, because they are um, without spiritual life, they don't have God in their life, and we, the Jews, are spiritually alive, that means that they don't have life, that means that they're dead. They're dead, and if we look in the Old Testament, you look at Numbers 19, we're told that if you come in contact with a dead corpse, you're unclean. And so since they're dead, we can't touch them, we can't be with them, because it would make us unclean. They're dead corpses. And what's weird is um, then there's a tradition that, that came out of that, that when in, in Numbers 19, if you touch a dead corpse, the, corpse, the, way, you, um, the way you move from uh, being unclean to clean again is that you have to take a bath. You have to wash yourself. And so there were these ritual washings, and they started these, um, they built these pools all over uh, Israel and Jerusalem called the mikvah, which is where you could go and immerse yourself and wash so that you can move from being unclean uh, to clean. And you know that there are a number of different things that can make you unclean, and you had to wash to get it off of you. But they developed the tradition that if somebody converted from being a Gentile to being a Jew, which you could do, you could become a Jew, you could convert, when you were converted, we think of the way you get converted is they would go through circumcision. And they did that. They, they would go through circumcision, but they paired with circumcision a ceremonial washing, which was, um, in Greek, a baptism. Okay, so they would be baptized to wash off the death that they had been in. And it was interesting because the Jews, if you were converted to Judaism, you went through circumcision, but that only applied to men. So women, what was the sign if a woman was converted? Well, it was a baptism. So men were circumcised and baptized, and women were just baptized, which made baptism this really actually important symbol in conversion, in moving from being a Gentile to being a Jew. So that's why when John the Baptist shows up and he's baptizing, there's actually a, a understanding, there's a tradition behind that. There's a reason why people understood, oh, he's baptizing, he's baptizing for the remission of sins. But the weird thing was that the baptism that John was bringing and the baptism that Jesus brought was not a baptism of conversion from being a Gentile to a Jew. It was a baptism for Jews who were already Jews. So so Jesus is showing up and saying, you think you're the living nation. You think they're the dead people. But you yourself actually need to be baptized. And what's really interesting is that, that in the Jewish tradition, when you were baptized, because it was moving from death to life, then they had all kinds of interesting traditions that kind of came alongside it because they believed that since you were going from death to life, you had a new life, which meant you were a baby. You, you, you were born again. You, were, you were, had this new life that you started as a new baby. And that tradition develops in the, on the Christian side. This is another, I'm, now I'm really rabbit trailing. But, but this, this is why on the Christian side in the early church, they started the tradition of doing things like bringing along godparents. So, so when you were baptized, you had two people who would come and they were supposed to be your spiritual parents. And because you were a new baby coming out from the water, you needed parents to raise you. And, but they were your spiritual parents, not your physical parents. That's where godparents came from. And some of the Christians got really weird with it. So they would believe, and this is actually on the Jewish side as well, they believed that when you went through this rebirth, that not only did you get new parents, but your old family kind of dissolved. And so, um, and so th- this is 
I'm just warning you, this is not biblical. This is a weird tradition that developed out of it. But they believe that things like the prohibition of marrying your sister or something like that, um, that that dissolved because that was not your family anymore. And so the, now this new family, you could not intermarry with your godparents because those that was your new family. And I think this is probably, you know, in um, 1 Corinthians 5, when Paul is rebuking the Corinthians saying, you're doing sick and twisted things. One man is marrying his stepmother. Um, it's probably something like that where they, they were reinterpreting what baptism did and coming up with bizarre applications of it. And Paul is telling us, don't be stupid, right? Um, yes, it's a rebirth. It is, but you're being weird about it and, and don't be stupid. Any, anyhow, so, so backing up then, there was this understanding then that when you, when you were converted, you were washed, and you were a new person. There was an understanding of that, but it was always an understanding that that's what happened to Gentiles when they became Jews. If you were a Jew, it's ridiculous to think that you need to be born again because you're a Jew. You don't need that. You already have life. And what happens is Jesus shows up in Israel, um, and he says, listen, all of you, you need to be converted. You need to be baptized. You need to actually have spiritual life. Um, so Jesus, um, the Jews, they had this baptism conversion that you're reborn to a little child. And Jesus is speaking to one of their leaders saying, actually, you are the one that needs to be baptized and reborn. This means that Nicodemus actually needs to be converted, but that's unfathomable to him. Right? It's unfathomable that, that he would need to actually be converted converted. Look at verses 5 and 6. Most assuredly I say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I'm just going to flip back a little bit. One of the things when you're reading John is just how you see all these things flow together and he's really developing certain themes all along and particularly this his encounter with Nicodemus in chapter 3 seems to be him recounting John 1 all over again. It's all the different elements in John 1 are showing up here. But if you look at John 1, 33, this is John the Baptist speaking. He says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, that this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus came with the purpose of baptizing with the Holy Spirit. This washing of regeneration that I just described that makes you a new person, Jesus came with the purpose of taking that baptism of the Spirit, this washing, this rebirth, this regeneration, he came with the purpose of bringing that and spreading it to the world. That's what he came to do. He came to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So this, now this, this baptism of the Holy Spirit then refers to the spiritual transformation of the individual being remade, brought from spiritual death to spiritual life by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. You know, we, we have this, all this terminology that we just throw around, but when you say regeneration, what does regeneration mean? Um, to generate is to make, okay? To, to make something become, come into existence. Regenerate is to regenerate it. It is to make it reborn. All right? Regeneration is just being born again. And that's what the Spirit does. It makes you born again. It regenerates you. So um, this regeneration, this uh, new birth, was prophesied back in Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel uh, 36. I'm starting at verse 25. This is a prophecy uh, looking forward, I think, to the coming of Christ. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols, your fallen dagons, as Ty described earlier. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Okay, so, so Nicodemus is looking forward to when God causes Israel to inherit its land, inherit its nation, and he'll be a, a leader, a ruler in that new Israel. And here the pro, here's the prophecy that he's thinking of when, when Israel is going to have this new land that they'll um, be able to walk in and God will be their God and they will be God's people. 
But it's, it begins with this promise that it's going to start with God sprinkling water on them. Now, if you're a Jew, you're thinking of that water of purification, that water uh, that becomes the water of baptism. He's going to sprinkle this water on them and make them clean. He's going to um, give them a new heart. Uh, put a new spirit in them, take away that heart of stone. He's going to put his spirit in them and give them the ability to walk in his law. That's the regeneration of him pouring out his spirit and washing them with water. So when this happened, then Israel would truly be God's people. Then they would be the kingdom of God. And this working of the spirit, when the spirit does this, it's, it's interesting how it's regularly per, portrayed by water. There in, in Ezekiel 36, he said, I'm going to sprinkle water on you. And this is what it's going to look like when the Spirit comes. It's going to be the sprinkling of water. Or look forward in John. John 7. I'm looking at verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right, out of, When you believe, he says, out of your heart flows living water. And then he says, and when I say water, what I mean by that is the Spirit. The Spirit is the water that is being described throughout all of this. God is going to pour his water on you and, and wash you and regenerate you, give you new birth. And that water is the pouring out of the Spirit who causes these things to happen. It's, it's interesting because if you look up to this point, the, the rabbis like using the image of water. But usually when they use the image of water, they use it to mean the Torah. The, the, the law, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's the water that washes you, law-keeping. Read, read the law, law-keeping, that washes you. When you learn how to do all of these things, that will wash you and make you clean. And Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 no. The, the water that you need is the Spirit because you can't keep the law. You can't do it. You, need to, you can't be, if I give you the water of the law to wash you, you're just going to end up dirtier and more condemned. But I'm going to give you the water of the Spirit. And when I give you the water of the Spirit and wash you, you'll find that you're suddenly now able to walk in his law. You'll actually be able to obey and to be faithful. The water is the Spirit. So Jesus said, the water you want is the Spirit. Look again at verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of times when you read that, I always struggle with figuring out how is there water and spirit? Is he talking about you have to be baptized and you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to get what he's describing? That was, that was the way, um, so during the Reformation, the Catholic Church would interpret it that way, that you have to, ha you have, to have baptism. There's a certain um, mandatory kind of baptism you have to receive, plus the spirit if you want to be uh, regenerate, if you want to have salvation. But the reformers understood the Greek a little bit differently, and I think it makes a little bit more sense out of the, the, the larger passage, where they, um, they would interpret that the water and the spirit, um, it's called ep epexegetically, which means um, the, the and there is not this and this. It means this and what's more this, or this and more specifically this, or this even this. A good example of this kind of um, use of that and would be 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus and him crucified. Okay, think about how that and is. I, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus and him crucified. Those aren't two different things, right? The second thing is saying more specifically... I, I, I want to know Jesus more specifically, or maybe even especially him crucified. You're zeroing in on what you meant when you said that first thing. And so when, when, when um, Jesus here says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I think what he's saying is, you must be reborn of the water. And, and if you understand what I'm saying is that then you'll understand that that water is the spirit. 
You must be born, born of the water. More specifically, the Holy Spirit that I've been describing to you that was in Ezekiel 36, that I described in John 1, that I'll talk about in John 7, that water that is the Spirit, you must be born of that. This washing that has been foretold for a long time is here now, and you need this washing if you want to enter into this kingdom. You must be born of the water, namely the Holy Spirit, or you must be born of the water that is the Holy Spirit. Now that doesn't make baptism negligible. It doesn't, it doesn't mean like, oh, so that means you don't need to worry about being baptized. Of course you're baptized. That's what he commanded us to do. But we're understanding that it is not the magic of the water. It is the working of the Holy Spirit that is making us reborn. And the water is pointing us to that Holy Spirit. So look at verse 6 then. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The flesh versus the Spirit divide here, I think, is, is man as he is on his own uh, versus man as the Spirit can make him. Sometimes when you see flesh, it's like the sin nature versus um, the Holy Spirit. I don't think he's necessarily saying your sin nature. It's just you without the divine aid of God, you in your own efforts, you without being spirit empowered. That which is uh, born of the flesh is flesh. That's what Nicodemus was. He is without the spirit and, and he hears these things and it's mysterious and he can't understand it. But when the spirit comes and you are reborn, then you see spiritual things, you hear spiritual things, you understand what he's talking about. So Nicodemus had already been born of the flesh, but he needed to be born of the spirit. He needed the water. Jesus would say this, that Jesus would say this to a leader of Israel, I think is just really striking. Look at verses 7 and 8. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So is everyone who has this spiritual rebirth. This is an interesting um, pun I think that's happening here because in in Greek the word for spirit pneuma is the same as the word for wind or breath so when you say pneuma it could mean wind or it could mean the spirit and it's the exact same in Hebrew uh, ruach means spirit but also means wind or breath and so when, when he says this the wind blows where it wishes. Well, it, you, you could translate that. The spirit blows where it wishes just as easily. They choose to translate it as wind because the verb is blows. And it makes more sense to say that the subject is wind. But he hasn't changed the subject from what he's been talking about. He's using the exact same word. The, the, the spirit wind, it blows where it wishes. You can hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So look at, back at, at chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What is the will, what is the decision that causes us to be born again, as he is described here in John 1? He says it's the will of God. And, and then here in, in, in John 3, he says... This spirit that regenerates you is a spirit that is mysterious to us, that is dictated and driven and steered by the mind of God and not by us. In other words, this rebirth, this regeneration that we experience is something that is given to us, that is performed by God on, a, on us, which we don't deserve or merit or decide for. It's something that we simply receive. It is the pure grace of God when we receive it. You're walking along hating God, and then he pours his love into your heart. He pours his spirit on you, and he remakes you. He makes you into a new creation, and you didn't deserve it. Regeneration, being born again, comes by the will and determination of God. Think back that Ezekiel 36 passage that I read just a moment ago where it says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going, to, I'm going to baptize you. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'll sprinkle you clean with this new water. That's Ezekiel 36. Um, if you can remember the book of Ezekiel very much, then you'll remember that Ezekiel 37 is actually this really famous passage where it describes this valley of dry bones, bones that are just laying there. And, he, and the prophet is looking and he sees out of nowhere this wind 
this, this, this breath, this spirit that blows across these dry bones. They're dead bones that if you touch them, they'd pollute you and contaminate you. And yet this wind blows across it and all of a sudden they come to life. This, and it goes hand in hand with what's going on in Ezekiel 36. This was a prophecy of the coming of Jesus, that there would be a time when God would pour out his water, and that water would be the spirit that would blow across the land, and the bones would come up. And there would be living people all over the place. I think this is why when, when um, Nicodemus is sitting there listening to Jesus and going, huh, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. Jesus says, you're a teacher in Israel. Have you not read Ezekiel? Do you, do you not know about this prophecy that this blessing was going to come? This is, this is why I think he's rebuking him is because it's a prophecy he should have seen. He should have understood and, and, and put together what was going on. If you look in uh, verses 9 and 10, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. It's, um, it's interesting. He's, he's a rabbi in Israel and can't put it together. But the wonderful irony, and I think this is the great irony of this, this little section, is that Nicodemus here is the example of unbelief, right? He's the example of somebody who, who doesn't get it, who can't see, who comes to Jesus at night because he's scared of other people catching him, and, and, he, and he's not putting it all together. And yet, he's simultaneously the picture of salvation, right? This, because we're, we're sitting here right as Nicodemus is receiving this truth. God is opening his eyes at this moment. So if you fast forward, remember at the end of the gospel, John 19 Jesus has been crucified. All of the disciples have abandoned him and have run because they're scared of being associated with him. They don't want to get caught. Peter himself has run away despite all of his vain boasting about how he would stand with Jesus. They've all run away. But look at verse 39. In verse 38, we're told that Joseph of Arimathea came and, and got his body. And then verse 39, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. So when everybody has forsaken Jesus, we find that Nicodemus is one of the few people who's ready to actually stand, step forward and stand with him at the moment that everybody else was abandoning him. So it's this great irony that Nicodemus is the picture of unbelief, but he's the picture of unbelief as he's becoming saved, as God is opening his eyes to who Jesus really is. Um, now, look at, at verse 11. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. I'll, I'll keep going. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Remember that um, at the beginning, Nicodemus said, Surely you're from God because you do all these amazing signs. And then I said that Jesus is about to let him know that he is from God in a much more profound sense. In a way that Nicodemus has no clue. He's about to realize that Jesus is from God in this much more profound sense. And you, he starts to hint at it in, um, in this verse. Verse 11. Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. He is suddenly switched to the plural. Who is with Jesus? Who, who is with him? He's now speaking of himself and the Father together. He's, he's starting to let Nicodemus know when he says he's from God, he means it in this way that Nicodemus had, had, um, had never expected. That Jesus himself was with the Father in heaven and is now speaking in the, in the first person plural of himself and the Father together. Jesus is explaining this knowledge is a knowledge that man does not naturally come to. It's a knowledge that comes from God as a gift to man. The, the, the truth that Jesus is revealing is not a truth that John could have, uh, or excuse me, that Nicodemus could have come to on his own. It required God stooping, God coming down, and God revealing himself to Nicodemus in order for Nicodemus's eyes to be open. Um, look at... Uh, 
verse 1, 18, going back to, I know I keep going back to chapter 1, but I think that chapter 3 is really unpacking chapter 1. Look at verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. You don't see God. You don't look at God. You don't see God. But the Son comes from God and reveals God to you. The Son, who is, who is God, comes and reveals the Father to you. He, he is the revelation of the Father. The Son who is with the Father, who was in heaven at that very moment, is the one who can reveal the Father to us. Um, we speak what we know, we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Look at verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. That's a really crazy statement. That he says, the Son of Man, who not who once was, the Son of Man who currently is in heaven. When, when Jesus came as the Son incarnate, the Son did not set aside his deity. Jesus uh, is a man and is restricted in his humanity, but the Son who is in Jesus is not, does not set aside his divinity. The Son was currently in heaven, even as Jesus was speaking. The Son filled the whole world, even as Jesus was speaking. And that's who was being revealed at this very moment. So we don't come to the kingdom of God. We don't go and find the door and knock and get ourselves in. The kingdom of God comes to us because God comes to us. Right? That, is, that is what the incarnation is. I think I um, walked through the Hebrew a while ago, that word Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The incarnation is God come down to us. We don't go to heaven. We don't find God. God comes down to us and reveals himself to us. And if you think about that for a moment, you'll see then that the, the sovereign grace that saves us, and what I mean by that is the fact that God decides where the Spirit goes. God reveals himself to you. God is the one who steers the Spirit and chooses those that he's going to bring to himself. That sovereign grace then goes hand in hand with this understanding of the deity of Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that is God is sovereign. He is the one who reaches to us. And that's what the incarnation was. We couldn't climb up to heaven. God came down to us and revealed himself to us. We couldn't get to God on our own. God came to us through Jesus Christ. Now look at verses 14 through 18. And we come to that you know, passage, including John 3.16, on all of our football stadiums. And spread out through everywhere. We need, so this is the context then for us to understand John 3.16. Here's a, another uh, rabbit trail. And, and it's necessary for understanding the, the imagery that Jesus uses here. If you can remember in, in Numbers chapter 21, the Israelites were once again complaining in the wilderness during the Exodus. The Israelites are complaining in the wilderness. And, and God sends fiery serpents that have poisonous bites. These, these fiery serpents, they're um, serpents, I think they were basically little seraphim that, are, that have poisonous bites that be, begin to sort of uh, torture the people by biting them. And if you're bitten by one of them, you will die. And so the people cry out and Moses cries out to God and he prays for the people and God gives him a solution. He says, make a, a bronze serpent, put it on a pole and set it up. And everyone who lifts up their eyes and looks to that, they will be delivered. They will be saved. All who looked on that bronze serpent then were healed. Look at verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We are all bitten. We're all bitten by the fiery serpent. We're all poisoned. We're all doomed to die. But he says that I'm going to give you another deliverance. I'm going to give you another fiery serpent that I will be lifted up. And when you lift up your eyes to this serpent that is lifted up, this, this image that has been lifted up, I'm going to heal you again. I'm going to heal you of this death that you have and give you eternal life. All who looked on the bronze serpent are healed and all who look, lift up their eyes and look at Jesus Christ will be healed as well. So Jesus uses this serpent as an image of what the Israelites must do once more. Okay? You're, you're, you're the Israelite nation, and the Israelites, again, you're all bit. You're all 
poisoned. You're all dying. And you need deliverance. And just the fact that you're a Jew is not saving you. You need to lift up your eyes so that you will be healed. Now this, this idea that, that, that Jesus will be lifted up in the same way that the, the bronze serpent was lifted up, it's specifically, I think, first referring to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. Okay, So just as that, that bronze serpent was on a pole, so Jesus will be on a pole, and you're called to lift up your eyes and look at him lifted up on that cross. If you look at um, John 12, verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, this is Jesus speaking, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Jesus refers to his death, his death on the cross, as his being lifted up. And, but he sees this crazy triumph in that moment, this this death that was supposed to be the humiliation, this death that was supposed to be the removal of this guy who was a, a pain to the, the Roman and the Jewish leaders, this death that's supposed to be a curse. We're told in the Old Testament, if you hang on a tree, you're cursed. This death that was supposed to be a curse, Jesus looks at it and sees in it a triumph. And I do think that the, the lifted up refers to more than just him being lifted up on the cross. When we, when we describe him He's lifted up on the cross but, and dies, and, but then he's uh, raised again from the dead. He's lifted up from the dead, and from there he's lifted again all the way to heaven in the uh, ascension as he sits down at the right hand of the Father. And all of that, I think, is all included in Christ being lifted up. But that first picture that we get of him being lifted up is that of a curse, and that's always God's way, where he has this glorious thing waiting for you, but you can't go to it until you embrace the difficult thing. You embrace that curse. And when we, when we see that, and we receive that, and are humbled through that, then we receive all, not just his death, but also his resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. So the lifted up is first the cross. He would hang on the cross as a serpent hung um, on the pole. But lifted up is also his resurrection and his ascension. It's his full glorification. That is what Jesus came for, to be lifted up, to give his life for this world. And our response then is to lift up your eyes and look with faith. That's how we receive it. We look on that and, and we look on that with faith and we receive this spirit. We receive this new birth. And that brings us then to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. On, the, on this passage, I think there's two things I want to point out. The first is that notice, and, and, and this is so important, that notice how love is ultimately defined for us. All right? We have love laid out for us. The perfect picture of love is the father giving his only begotten son. Right? It's the father giving his son for you. That is what love looks like. It's the sacrificial giving of himself. That is how God loved us. That is what God's love for you looks like, is him giving himself to you. That is the fundal, fundamental revelation of what God's love looks like. How he loved you, he gave his son for you. He loved by giving to us. He gives himself, and Jesus is the perfect proof of this. And then the second thing to, to note in this is that our response is that of simply receiving. Simply receiving his love, what he has given to us. We receive by faith, look at verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already. So, so the world is cursed. The world is snake bit. The world is under death. The world is a dry field of bones. Right? That's the world. And we're in that world. And, we, and the spirit blows and our eyes open and we look to the sun lifted up and we receive that by faith. We simply receive that by faith. The washing of the water is not you keeping his law perfectly. That's not to say you don't obey, but that comes as a result, not as a cause. The washing of the water is not you keeping the law. The washing of the water 
is God pouring out his spirit on you and bringing you to life. So um, you are, um, and when you believe, you enter into the kingdom of God that Nicodemus couldn't see. You're washed clean with the water of the spirit and you're reborn with a new life, an eternal life. That's the gospel. That's just the gospel. And it's, we're, um, I think that we have a tendency to kind of roll our eyes at evangelicalism because um, we often embarrass ourselves with our cheesiness. But, um, you know, you, you, uh, you're, you're not that bad off. You know, you're not that far off when you look to John 3.16. Right? It, 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 it's actually a, a pretty decent text to center our understanding of the gospel on. It's a pretty great declaration of what God has done for us and what it looks like to receive what God has done for us. Um, and and the, the other thing that I would want to note is that um, there's a tendency, I think, that we are constantly wrestling with a world that is attempting to smear Christianity, to, that is attempting to portray your faith as something horrific, as something awful, as something, um, it's the patriarchy. It's the, and you could, you could go on and on about all of the different abuses of your faith and, um, and how wicked your faith is. But here is, here is the thing. When you see this as the thing that is at the center, right? When you understand what, what does it look like when God reveals himself to you? When he opens your eyes and shows you what he is really like. What he is really like is the father who gives his son for you. Who, who, who gives his son for you with you doing nothing to deserve it. Who, who gives his son to you with you not even making the effort, but him actually opening your eyes and him bringing you to life. It is pure mercy. It is pure love. It is this incredible, sacrificial love. And when, when you look at that, I, I look at the world and I say, who has anything on that? Who, who, is, who is describing an, uh, a competing God that comes even close to that? Who, who is telling a story that is more beautiful and more glorious than that? Right? You can find problem texts in the Old Testament. You can find problem texts in the New Testament that you wonder, how does this work out? How does this, how does this, um, how does this you know, resolve itself? But when you come and you look at who God is and what he has done for you, you see clearly a God that you can't be embarrassed by that. Right? You, you can't walk away from that and, and, and describe it as anything other than glorious and transcendent and worth all of your life. Right? That is a God that is worth serving. So that's the gospel. How can you be embarrassed or ashamed of a God that loves you like this? Look at the last few verses. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So think about it. Nicodemus comes under the cover of darkness. He doesn't want to be seen. He's embarrassed by who he is. He's embarrassed by what he's about. He's embarrassed. And, he, and, and his embarrassment, he's trying to cover with darkness. But when you come to Jesus, you come to the light, right? The, light, the lights go on and you suddenly start to see. You suddenly, and, and Nicodemus comes to the light because on that night when Jesus is crucified and his body is left hanging there and everyone else is running, Nicodemus is the one who's going to walk forward and identify himself with Christ. He's no longer embarrassed or ashamed of the light. Look at, um, I'm going to go back to chapter 1. I want to read just these last few verses. And, and again, you'll see how chapter three, really, 3 is really just unpacking chapter 1. Starting at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gospel, for this good news of your Son given for us. We thank you for your salvation. 
for being washed of all of our sins. We thank you for the light that shines into the darkness and leads us to you. We thank you for a love that gives, and we thank you for eternal life. We thank you for Jesus, and may we proclaim his name faithfully to the world around us. And may we see a field of dry bones come to life at the breath of your spirit. And so we pray, as your son taught us to pray, saying, Each Sunday our service culminates and leads up to a meal. It is a family meal. It's a royal feast. It's a spiritual meal. Let me explain each of those. First, God has adopted you into his family. If you've been baptized into Christ by faith, God owns you as his beloved son or daughter. He's your father. As the father of fathers, he nourishes his children. This meal nourishes your faith by assuring you of Christ indwelling you by his spirit. It sustains you until at last you reach your heavenly rest. Our brother brings us here so that the father might nourish our faith, giving us grace to enjoy true unity and fellowship with him and all those who are born of God, our Father. That is why this is a family meal. But it's also a royal feast. Here is the broken body and the spilled blood of the anointed hero. Broken and bloody, he died. Not in defeat, but because by his death he conquered the devil, that murderer from the beginning. The victorious king has now spread this royal table, spread it with the richest of fare, and invited his guests to gather around to celebrate the peace his war has won. Our enemies are conquered, so eat with jubilant gratitude, for you are in fact citizens of the kingdom won by Christ's body and blood. And finally, this is a spiritual meal. We take it by faith. We trust that all the spiritual realities of our adoption by Christ and our conquest in Christ are present here. Here we receive rich promises. Here we taste true joy. Here we partake of true unity. Here is Christ, all of Christ, given for you. You are made a son or daughter of God. You are reckoned as a citizen of his endless kingdom. kingdom. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our adoption into your household. We thank you for sending your son as a mighty hero to do battle with all the powers of darkness in order to defeat them and deliver your elect from death. And we thank you that in this mystic meal, you promise us everlasting life through faith in the son whose body was given for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. The charge is this, the message of the gospel is summed up. That's why this passage this morning is such a favorite, is that it's a summary of the gospel. It's this, you must be born again. You didn't choose to be born the first time any more than you can choose to be born anew by the regeneration, the operation of the Holy Spirit. So remember that salvation, being given new life, is a gift that is given, not a right which you may demand. So if you are born again, the response to this message that you must be born again and that you can't make yourself be born again, the, the, the response to it is this. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for converting me. Thank you for giving me a new heart. Thank you for uh, causing me to be born again. And if you are not born again, the response is going to be protest and offense and defensiveness and wanting to say, look at my good works. Look at, look at the family I was born into. I was, as Nicodemus was tempted to say, look, I was born a Jew. Or as we might be tempted to say, look, I was born a Presbyterian. It's not looking at what you can do or what you've given or what your works are. You look to Christ. Now hear the blessing of the Father. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And amen.